Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Everybody, I'm Don an alcoholic. Absolutely delighted to be here. I want to thank my host, Lucas, for that adequate in- introduction. Uh, I want to thank uh, Tony and the committee for the kind invitation to be here this weekend. And uh, Tony called me and she said, uh, your host, Lucas, will be calling you any day. And, uh, and November went by and, uh, and December went by. And when he got around the call and I said, we'll just see you at the conference, young man. <laughs> no, and he's a great guy. And thank you for say, taking such uh, good care of me and Eileen. And thank you for everybody uh, who stopped to say hello and shake hands and make me feel comfortable. You know, when I get out of town, I get a little weird when I'm out of my AA backyard, you know, in my home group with my guys doing my thing. You get me out on the road among a lot of people, I forget that we're all the same in Alcoholics Anonymous and you're as twisted and messed up as I am because I always, I get in a room like this, I go, God, they just, they must have that other program because they look better than me and they, you know, and you, your head starts working on you and uh, I'll tell you about my home group, you know, it's the SOS Men's Group, it's in Bellingham, Washington, we meet on Monday and Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock and uh, it's a terrific meeting, it's a third legacy group and there's a lot of young guys in that group, you know, getting sober and staying sober and sponsoring each other and I absolutely love my home group, you know, uh, you know, we're strong backs, weak minds, you know what I mean, just uh, not really a hotbed of mental health but a lot of really good AA and... uh, and as I said, you know, I'm from Bellingham, Washington. If you don't know where, where that at is at, you know, go to Seattle and then drive about 100 miles north. Uh, stop 20 miles from the Canadian border and you'll be in Bellingham. I mean, we're right up there against British Columbia, um, you know, America's first defense against Canada, I suppose. And, uh, uh, which I got to tell you, if Canada ever makes their move, we're in a lot of trouble because it's a college town. There's a bunch of... You know, left-wing hippie smoking dope. I could just see Canada rushing the border. Welcome, dude. You know, just. <laughs> I want to thank my beautiful wife for traveling with me. And uh, I love you, Eileen. I've been married 22 years and uh, sober a long time. And <laughs> She's uh, 26 good-looking years sober. And, you know, I'm 27 years sober. I got 10 months on her, which means absolutely nothing in our home. I just, absolutely nothing. You know, the only fun with it is, you know, for two months a year, we have the same year. And the other rest of the year, I'll have a year ahead of her, you know. So every now and then, being married a long time, we'll have a spiritual disagreement, we'll call it. And, uh, and I'll get to say things like, well, you know, honey, when you turn 27, this will all make sense to you. And, uh, <laughs> And we're from Los Angeles originally, so in 2004, you know, about almost 15 years ago now, we moved up to the Pacific Northwest. You know, we want to get out of the rat race, and we're, we're city kids, man. We're concrete, steel, and glass, you know what I mean? And uh, so moving up to Bellingham was kind of a culture shock. We're 10 miles out of town, we're out in the woods, out by the lake, and I mean, it's dark at night. You know what I mean? Like, it's darkity dark, dark, and uh, we weren't used to that, I mean... I remember the first time I forgot something in the car and I didn't have the porch light on, I didn't have a flashlight, you know, and I just sauntered out to the car to get it. And I got about halfway there and this little voice in my head said, cougar. And I just like stood straight up and I just, I ran back in the house and I slammed the door and I'm against the door and my wife's like, what's with you? And I said, don't go out there, dark, darkity dark, dark. So we're adjusting, you know, because... Because we were excited, you know, we got a lot of wildlife out there, and we're not used to that. And I mean, uh, God, I remember we moved there, and when we first moved there, we'd drive all over, and there's great, great dairy farms out there, and the bay, and the mountains, and, uh, you know, the Cascade Mountains are out there, and Mount Baker, and 
So one day we were out in the county and uh, we're just driving around looking at all these beautiful farmlands and, uh, and there was this gorgeous Jersey cow that was right up against the road in the fence. And Eileen goes, stop the car, stop the car. And so I stopped the car in the middle of this two lane road and my wife jumps out and gets to the middle of the road with her camera to take a picture of this beautiful cow. And right about this time, this old truck comes around the corner, bup, 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 and it stops right next to my wife. And then the truck is this old farmer. He rolls down his window and he looks at my wife and he goes, you do know it's a cow. <laughs> and my wife real energetically goes, uh-huh. And he goes, just checking and drove off. <laughs> but we're adjusting. Uh, so... And uh, enough about cows, let's talk about drinking. Let's talk about Alcoholics Anonymous. I got to tell you, it's, uh, I'm very excited to be here. I'm excited to be anywhere in the world in January in Alcoholics Anonymous. January in AA, man, that's our unofficial membership drive, isn't it? <laughs> oh, I love January in AA. Hopes are high, you know, everybody's coming back to AA. This is going to be the year, you know, and, we're, and hopefully we're ready, you know, because... Uh, you know, the newer people that have been here a couple of years, they're picking up on it. They're like, is it me or are there more people here than usual? Oh, no. No. Because we got a lot of AA members that just don't go to AA anymore. But they go in January, you know what I mean? You know, they ruined Christmas again, sober. You know, got in a fight with the wife again, sober. And they're like, well, you know, you were better when you were going to AA and calling your sponsor. Yeah, that's not it. That's not it. And they'll show up with multiple years of sobriety in AA in January. And you go, Bill, it's good to see you. How you been? Fine. What'd you hear? <laughs> Get a cup of coffee, Bill. It's going to be okay. So I love January and Alcoholics Anonymous. I love being a sober member of AA. And uh, I never thought I'd make it to Alcoholics Anonymous. It wasn't on my wish list of things to do. Uh, I'm a real alcoholic. I'm not a social drinker. I'm not a moderate drinker. I'm not a heavy drinker, although I look like a heavy drinker. Uh, we look the same, you know, a heavy drinker will match me drink for drink. Here's the difference between me and the heavy drinker, right? You get a heavy drinker in front of you and you, the boss tells him, you keep, you keep drinking, you're going to lose your job. Wife tells him, you keep drinking, you're going to lose your marriage. Doctor tells him, you keep drinking, you're going to lose your health and die. And a heavy drinker doesn't want to lose his wife, his job, or his health, actually stops drinking. Doesn't have to go to AA, doesn't have to work 12 golden steps, doesn't have to have a home group, doesn't have to work with sponsors that don't listen to them, he just stops. And his life gets better. Now, here's where we're confusing to the entire world. You see, I have the same emotional reaction as the heavy drinker to losing my wife, losing my health, or losing my job. I don't want to lose those things either. I just don't have the power to stop. In fact, when I try to exert my willpower in my life to stop drinking, when I'm presented with a good reason to stop, I actually drink more, not less. It seems to produce an anxiety in me I can't explain. Where intellectually, I'm sitting there drinking myself to death going, I can't do this, it's going to cost me everything as I pour the next drink. See, I'm an alcoholic. I've lost the power of choice where drink is concerned, and I don't know that. And when I'm drinking that way, I'm drinking uninformed. And when you're drinking in ignorance, you're bringing a knife to a gunfight. Uh, I'm not a social drinker. I've seen social drinking. Uh, it's quite terrifying, actually. I don't understand it. Uh, <laughs> my favorite story about social drinking, when Eileen and I uh, got engaged, uh, my family was very excited that I was actually with somebody of Eileen's caliber. They couldn't figure it out. They thought I had drugged her or something. And, uh, and my sister met Eileen, and my sister fell in love with Eileen. In fact, she pulled me aside right after she met Eileen. She said, if you screw this up, I will kill you. And... Uh, and they threw a big engagement party for us. So there's a lot of social drinking going on at this engagement party, what I call white wine drinking. Not really drinking, drinking, crash the car, go to jail drinking, just, you know, <laughs> social drinking. And so we're in the kitchen, you know, we're drinking our club sodas. My sister has a glass of white wine, and she sees some people in the living room she wants to welcome to the party. She goes, I'll be right back. She puts her white wine down, and she walks away. Eileen happened to notice that. And she's looking at Pat's white wine, and she's looking at my sister getting further away. She's looking at Pat's wine wine, and my sister getting further away, and she goes, Pat left her wine. And I said, yeah, honey, she did. She goes, oh, should I go tell her? And, uh...
I said, baby, at this particular moment, she's not suffering from separation anxiety, you know? <laughs> so I'm a real alcoholic. I have that strange, bizarre relationship with alcohol where I have a mind, regardless of how much trouble is coming to my story, how many hearts I break, promises I break, knees I skin, doesn't matter how bad my life looks to you or to me, I won't have the power to stop. I have a mind that can't let go of the idea of when it worked. I can't seem to forget what makes the big hurt go away. It's in the room with me all the time. I wake up with it and it walks with me through my day and it doesn't matter if I don't want to drink. It's got all the time in the world and my head is its playground. And eventually I surrender to that desperate experiment of the first drink after a brief period of sobriety, which for me can be two to five to six days. And when I put alcohol of any type into my system, it seems to set off an allergic reaction, which we refer to as the phenomenon of craving and once too many and a million is not enough and I can't stop drinking. And it doesn't matter that I stopped at the bar to have a couple. It doesn't matter that I said I'm going to have a six-pack and call it quits. It doesn't matter. Because, you see, I think I'm in control. I think I'm making the, the decisions. I think I'm calling the shots. But you put alcohol into my system, and alcohol's doing everything. And it didn't start out that way. I love the effect produced by alcohol. It talks about that in the doctor's opinion. Men and women drink essentially for the effect produced by alcohol. And in this room, we all go, yeah, we know what that is. But I'm going to tell you something. You get a very different answer to the question of what the effect is out there. And if you don't believe me, talk to a normal drinker. Talk to a social drinker. Ask them what the effect is produced by alcohol. I did it with my brother-in-law. He's a social drinker. He's not one of us. I said, Larry, what's the effect produced by alcohol? He thought I was funny, but he knew I was sober. He played along. He said, well, you know, some days I feel like having a cocktail. Maybe it's a celebration or maybe I had a tough day. And I drink that cocktail. And it produces a feeling in me I don't know of, relaxation. And I usually enjoy it. If there's music playing, I start to hear the music. You know, I feel that beat, baby, you know? <laughs> and it goes so well that I usually decide to have a second cocktail. And somewhere, I don't know, in the middle of that second cocktail, I start to feel it. So I stop. No, you don't. No, it's about to get good. Hit the accelerator. And I don't understand that he's having a normal reaction to beverage alcohol, that his body's starting to send him signals. That's enough. Let's shut this down. We're feeling out of control. We're feeling a little weird. We're feeling a little queasy. We don't want any more of this. We're just fine. And he pushes it aside and doesn't have another thought about it. See, I'm an alcoholic. I'm part of that 10%. We get a different set of signals. Actually, we only get one signal. More. <laughs> more, 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 more. And I don't know that because I'm only drinking my own body, so I don't know I'm having an, an, an normal reaction to alcohol. And when you don't know that about yourself, you're drinking in ignorance. You're bringing that knife to a gunfight. But the early part of my drinking is awesome. I love the effect produced by alcohol. What is the effect? In the word, it's relief. Relief from what? From what swirls around in my head in a sober state? I've always been self-obsessed. I've always been self-centered. I had that long before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I don't know if I was born alcoholic. I don't get into the argument about the progression or how fast it is. But I will tell you this. I, I believe there was something wrong with me from the gate. You know what I mean? And most of us have that thing. You know, I don't know if I was born alcoholic, but I was definitely born weird. You know what I mean? Half a bubble off a plum. You know, there's something wrong with the boy. They just couldn't put their finger on it, you know? Kind of kid laying in bed at night. I didn't have to come to AA to learn how to do a nightly review. I did that at six years old. You know what I mean? Lay in bed, just going, ah, oh, kindergarten almost killed me today. And, uh, <laughs> hate that teacher. Going to get her. Going to hit her with that wooden boat. She'll never see it coming. You know, just... I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, you guys gave me the definition of the sanity. So we take the same drink over and over again, expecting different results. We take the same action over and over again, expecting different results. And I remember being new in AA, and I went, oh, my God. I've been doing that with my whole life forever, long before I drank. I remember being five years old, a little pre-alcoholic, self-obsessed, thinking about myself in the sewing room, playing with a bobby pin. I looked to my right, there was an electrical outlet. I remember thinking, this looks like it'll fit. <laughs> Bam! And I got shot across the room, and my fingers are smoking, and my hair standing straight up. And I remember thinking, did that just happen? 
did that hurt as bad as I think it did? <laughs> Bam! And, uh, <laughs> and based on the way I lived my life till I came to AA and for a long time afterwards, I know I would have went for three, but I was unconscious, you know? <laughs> Early part of my drinking was great. You take anything, a night with a beautiful woman, going to your favorite band in concert, playing ball with your buddies, you pour whiskey on top of that, it just gets better. It seemed to be accentuating an already full life. And when trouble came into my story, that's no big deal. My alcoholism will pay, you know, keep pace with the consequences that come into my story. Because if you're going to be a drinking drunk, if you're going to go to the finish line with your alcoholism, you can't let a little thing like looking bad slow you down. And my alcoholism will give me what I need to keep up with the consequences. And the two best friends I ever acquired for a drink and drunk were justification and rationalization. Which means you've got to be able to go to jail. And when you get out of jail to face the people that love you the most and want the best things in the world for you, you've got to look them right in the eye and say this. Well, <laughs> everybody goes to jail once in a while. <laughs> no, they don't. I've been sober 27 years. I have met hundreds of people that have never been to jail. It's remarkable. Let me, you know, we'll do an experiment right here. How many people in this room have been handcuffed? Oh, yeah, yeah. You don't get that at Rotary. But in here, you're a room of experts, you know what I mean? I mean, they cuff us and we give them pointers. Oh, that's too tight. You're cutting the blood off. That's not... Oh, for, God, for God's sakes, watch my head. You know? <laughs> but we think it's normal. Our alcoholic life seems the only normal life. We go to jail. We get handcuffed. We break hearts. We crash cars. We lose jobs. We ruin holidays. We make our kids cry. And it's just Tuesday, man. It's just the way we live. And we get beaten to a state of acceptance about something that's unacceptable. Life of the drunk, it's not funny. It's not cute. It's tacky. It's pathetic. It's wasteful. And it's the biggest destructor in the world. You see, my alcoholism will take everything I got. It'll take it all. But it wants more. Because when it's done taking everything from me that it can possibly take, it goes after my family. And anyone that has the misfortune of caring about a guy like me, if you stand next to me for too long and you love me, my alcoholism will take a bite out of you. Because the tentacles of alcoholism never stop spreading out. When I was 25 years old, I got the gift of self-knowledge. Self-knowledge is not delivered to you by a family member, a doctor that's stitching you up, or an employer that's calling you on the carpet or an arresting officer. Self-knowledge is delivered to you in your own head, in your own voice, and it happened to me at two in the morning in a hotel room and there was all this screaming and I realized the room was dead quiet and the screaming was in my mind. And my mind was screaming to me in my own voice that I was gonna die if I didn't do any, something about my drinking. And I got it. For years they've been talking to me about my drinking and for years they thought they had the wrong guy. And I remember the moment I had that self-knowledge that I had to quit drinking or I was going to die. I wasn't sad. I wasn't depressed. I was hopeful. I was confident. I was lifted up because now I knew. Now I understood. It's okay. I'll do something about this. I'm ready for a different experience with life. And I didn't come to AA, get a sponsor or a home group. What I did is I made the alcoholic declaration. I told everybody that would listen, I was quitting drinking, so don't try to tempt me. I called my pharmaceutical representative of record, Juan, and uh, I said, Juan, uh, don't sell me anything even if I beg, uh, because they're a very reputable lot. They uh, won't sell you anything if you ask them not to. Uh, no, Don, I can't take your $500. You made me promise. <laughs> and, and, I actually, and I actually quit drinking without AA. Uh, without sponsorship, without steps, without God, without anything, just on my own power. Uh, thank you very much uh, for two weeks. Um, <laughs> you know, the worst thing about that two weeks is, unbeknownst to me, my family have been having those backroom meetings about me for years, talking about my drinking. 
What are we going to do about Donald? He's drinking himself to death. He's going to jail. He's blowing through relationships. He looks terrible. What are we going to do? And they would talk amongst themselves, and they'd say, God, you know, when we bring it up, he gets defensive or he laughs it off. You know, he doesn't get it, and if he doesn't get it, he doesn't get it. There's nothing we can do. And they were just preparing themselves for the end. And at 25 years old, I snap out of it, and I tell everybody I'm quitting drinking, so don't try to tempt me, and my family's having those backroom meetings, and they're saying to each other, did you hear? Oh, did you hear the good news? No, he quit drinking. No, he really, no, he didn't go to jail or nothing. It was his idea. Oh, it's going to be great. No, he's going to work five days a week. No, I saw him last week. He looks good. And I don't understand what I've just done to my family. I've given them the cruelest thing I can possibly give a drunk's family. I've given them false hope. And the reason being, when I told them I was quitting drinking and I looked them in the eye, they knew I meant it. They knew I was telling them the truth. I wasn't in denial. I wasn't in delusion. I absolutely meant it. I didn't want to live like an animal anymore. I didn't want to hurt you anymore. Don't you understand? I have a front row seat for the destruction of my life. Do you think I'm a casual observer? Do you think it looks bad from over there? Try to wake up with it every day. Try to wonder where your dreams went. Try to wonder why you can't keep your word to yourself or anyone else anymore. Try to have the front row view of that. I'm not drinking in ignorance. I know everything that's happened to me. I know what's happened to my life, and I have no way to explain it. And I make that sweet promise, and I tell my family I'm quitting, and I give them that false hope. And there's one thing I didn't understand. There's no room for the truth where the game of alcoholism is played out. When I said it, I meant it, and I was telling the truth, but the truth doesn't stand a chance against my alcoholism. And two weeks later, I'm drunk. And two weeks later, my family's going, what happened? And two weeks later, I buckle them in, and we go on a six-year ride till I make it to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, reading about everything you, you read about in Chapter 3. Various vain attempts to control and enjoy my drinking. Brief periods of control, followed always by a still worse relapse. And I took my family on that ride. And it's a funny thing, though. I talk so comfortably and so disclosingly about what I did to my family at a podium from Alcoholics Anonymous. Yet, when I arrived in AA, I was singing a very old, familiar newcomer song. The only person I hurt was me. I'm so self-obsessed, so consumed with the power of my alcoholism and the destruction in my life, I don't have time to see what I'm doing to you as I'm roaring through your life over and over again. And you say things to me like, if you love me, you wouldn't do this. If you love me, you wouldn't act this way. If you love me, you wouldn't treat us this way. And you don't understand that love's got nothing to do for it. There's no room for love where the game of alcoholism is played out. You see, you don't exist. You see, it's got me in blinders. All I can see is myself. I wake up in self. I move through the day in self. And my alcoholism only has one job, and that job isn't to kill me. That job is to get the next drink. And if you get between me and a drink, you become disposable. I'll go around you, manipulate you, tell you what you want to hear, but bet your bottom dollar I'm getting to the drink. And when you don't know anything about alcoholism, you can't warn people. You can't say it's going to happen again. Yes, I love you. No, I don't want to live this way. But I'm an alcoholic. I am powerless over that first drink. I'm going to do it again. Bet your bottom dollar. Get away from me. Save yourself. But I can't warn you. So I say things like, I'm sorry. And I love you. And I didn't mean for it to get away from me. Can you give me another chance? The sad song of the drinking alcoholic. I didn't mean it. Can you give me another chance? And it got hard for my family to give me those second and those third and those 30th chances as I roared through their life year after year after year. I pulled the big geographic, left Los Angeles, went to Boston because L.A. was my problem. Then they found out they drink in uh, Boston. (laughs) I think they drink more. I came back to Los Angeles after three years and got the best job I've ever had in my life. And I don't need my best job drinking. I mean, to date, it's the best job I've ever had in my life. Alcoholics are phenomenal, man. We are like a cat flung outside a second-story window. And we just... We'll just fly through the air and land on our feet, boom, in a three-piece suit in a job interview. (laughs) Why would I be an asset to your company? Why don't you let me ask you a question? Why would I want to work for your company? (laughs) And we get the job. I mean, it's like we can get the job, get the girl, get the money. We just can't keep any of it usually. Um, 
And you know the rest of the story. I did a great job for them until they told me I was doing a great job, and then my alcoholism caught up with me, and I got fired for my drinking, and I end up at 31 years old in Simi Valley, California, where everybody ends up if you're a drunk of my type, living with my family, living with my older sister, the last relative on the planet that hadn't quit on me, with everybody telling her, look, he's going to break your heart. He's going to do it again. Leave him alone. There's nothing you can do for him. But she wouldn't quit on me, the family member that hangs in there till the bitter end, the ones that keep us alive till we make it to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. My sister hadn't been there for me to have a different speaker today. I owe her my life. She had no reason to hang in there with me. And man, I was in that. She said, you come live at my house, but if you drink, you're out of my house. And uh, I drank every day in that house for seven months until I got sober. And if you don't know how you do that when they're watching you, I don't know, maybe you're not a sneaky rat like I am. I got no problem drinking around your schedule. I'm unemployed. (laughs) (laughs) What time do you go to work? 7 a.m., bars open. Uh, But at the end of my drinking, I'm not drinking so I feel like I'm better looking or so I have courage or any of those. I'm doing oblivion drinking. You know what I mean? I'm getting the whiskey on board hard enough and fast enough to shut off my head so I can go into a blackout, so I can come to you to face the hideous four horsemen. Terror, frustration, bewilderment, despair. They sat on the end of the bed that I'm mooching off of my family, waiting for me to come to, and then they talked to me in my voice, in my head, asking questions, making statements. Who are you going to hurt today, Don? Who are you going to rip off today, Don? You know, you've taken every good thing that's ever come your way, and you've torn it to shreds, and now you're ripping your family off. How's it going to end for a guy like you? I don't know what you do with a head like that when you're hungover in the morning, but I just took another pull off the jug, and I thought it was going to end that way. I got an unemployment check a few days before I got so, uh, sober. I rolled up with my brother-in-law, and I said, Larry, I got my check. Can I, can I borrow your car and go cash it? Larry asked me a strange question. He said, Don, will you be coming back this time? And, uh, <laughs> which was fair. I had borrowed his car a few times that summer and gone out on little alcoholic vacations. We know what those are. And uh, the 12 and 12 tells me my outstanding characteristic is defiance. And when Larry said that to me, I got right in his face. And I said, Larry... How dare you? (laughs) You know, Larry, the last time this happened, I apologized. Uh, (laughs) I opened my heart to you, Larry. I don't really need this crap. And uh, Larry, untreated Al-Anon that he was, felt terrible. And he took his keys out. And I remember remember snatching the keys from this man. I'm mooching a room off to walk out of his house to get in his car. And I remember thinking, there better be gas in it. Delusions of entitlement. I went to the liquor store where alcoholics of my type cash or unemployment checks. I have what the book refers to as the thought that precedes the first drink. In my mind, it always sounds like this. What's in a half pint of whiskey? Nobody ever got into trouble drinking a half pint. So I drank a half pint of whiskey, and that half pint worked so well, I drank another half pint, and I thought, I can go visit those friends in the valley. I'll be back in a half an hour. They won't even miss me, and I'm gone. Three days later... I'm driving up the hill to face that family I'd done over again. I've taken their hope, faith, and trust, torn it to shreds again. And you need to understand, driving up the hill to face that family, I love them no less than I love them at this very moment. And I love my family tremendously. But I can't serve two masters. i only got time to serve one, and that's King Alcohol. And I don't know that. So I'm as surprised as the family is that it happened again. They're confused and baffled. I'm confused and baffled. You see, what I tell you is I love you with my lips, but what you see is the actions that tell you I care about you not. I walk into a home that's been devastated by the disease of alcoholism to find out an argument had broken out in my absence. My brother-in-law wanted to report the car stolen. My sister negotiated him down to a missing persons report. They saw me pull up and they called the cops. And the cops are on their way up to do the follow-up work. I find this out. I got warrants for my arrest in two counties, and I started screaming at my sister. You called the cops? I got warrants. I'm going to jail. Thanks for nothing, because now it's her fault. And uh, I walk outside to wait for the police, because I don't want the interview to go on in front of the family. I don't know what I'm going to be saying, but I'm fairly certain I'll be lying. You know what I mean? And... uh, And I'm out there smoking a cigarette, and here comes the black and white. And on the side of the black and white, it says, canine unit. (laughs) And I remember thinking, oh, good. They brought the dog. (laughs) Like I'm in any shape to make a run for it. And uh, (laughs) 
And, and the cop got out and he started asking me those hard, tough questions that trained professionals are trained to ask, like, uh, where were you? And uh, everything I remember is illegal, so I'm lying to him. And he starts locking eyes with me, and I don't like that, man. So I break his gaze, and he breaks with me and locks me over here. So now we're interviewing and dancing. And, <laughs> and I don't feel good, you know what I mean? And I... My hands are getting wet, and I just wanted to divert his attention, and I had seen the dog in the back seat, and I pointed at the dog, and I go, hey, is that your partner? And he says, well, yes, it is. And he walks over, and he opens the door, and this dog gets out. German Shepherd. Not a hair out of place. <laughs> like a Rin Tin Tin reincarnate. And uh, with no prompting on my part, he started to relay facts to me about the dog's life. Dog's past mandatory retirement. They can't retire him. He's too good. The dog has participated in more arrests than any dog in the history of Ventura County. The dog has participated in more arrests and rescues than any dog in the history of Ventura or Los Angeles County. This dog was so phenomenal that the officers took a collection out of pocket to send him over to Europe for international competition where he kicked butt on German, German shepherds, right? <laughs> So I said to the cop, I said, well, that's a phenomenal dog you have there, sir. And a thought flew in the back of my mind. It kind of thought the minute you think it, you know, it's the tr truth. You, you want to deny it, but you know it's the truth. And what the truth was is this dog had done significantly more with his life than I'd done with mine. <laughs> I hated that dog. I walked back into a house that's been de devastated by the disease of alcoholism and I beg for another chance. They want me gone and I got nowhere to go. And I'm telling them how sick I am and I'm telling them how I'll die out there and I'm telling them they gotta give me a couple of days and they're not buying it and finally out of my mouth comes, I'll go to AA and everything. No idea why I said that. It was an over demonstration I think at that particular moment. Duh. And it's not like my family believed I was going to go to AA. My first week in Alcoholics Anonymous, my sister drove me to AA and picked me up from AA. You know, it makes you feel when you look the way I look and you get in your older sister's compact car at the end of an evening of Alcoholics Anonymous all scrunched up and she's driving you back to her place, her 31-year-old loser brother. So, Donald, what'd you learn in AA tonight? <laughs> I don't remember my first night in Alcoholics Anonymous. They assure me I was there and entertaining. Uh, but I remember my second night in AA because it's the most important night of my sobriety. You see, I had attended the 6 o'clock meeting of the Simi Valley Alano Club. It was an hour and a half meeting. It ended at 7.30. There was a break from 7.30 to 8 o'clock, and then the 8 o'clock meeting would start and go from 8 o'clock to 9.30. That 6 o'clock meeting is over now, and it's 7.30, and I'm sitting in a meeting hall of Alcoholics Anonymous with my back against the wall, and I didn't look that night the way I looked this morning. I got long hair, and it's greasy, and it's down the middle of my back because I don't shower anymore, and I don't shave. Got a full beard with food stuck in it. I've lost the ability to speak the King's English. I'm suffering from audio and visual hallucinations. I communicate in a series of hand gestures, grunts, and clicks. I'm wearing my sunglasses at night. I got my arms folded across my chest like so, and I'm just looking at the room like this, and back and forth. And I'm not doing this because I'm a tough guy. I'm doing this because I'm trying not to explode from the inside out because every molecule in my body is screaming to have a drink because I'm coming up on 48 hours of physical sobriety, and I'm physically addicted to alcohol. And the good people of Alcoholics Anonymous at the Simi Valley Alano Club are giving me a wide berth that night because I'm dangerous because I'm terrified, and anybody terrified is dangerous. And as they're walking away from me and walking around me and satelliting around me and looking over at me, but nobody's approaching me, I'm thinking to myself, what am I doing here? They don't even want me here. They won't even come say hi to me. What, what, what made you think coming to AA was a good idea? 
Why do you do this to us, Don? Why do you do this? Oh, you're quitting drinking. How many times have we quit drinking? A thousand? And then what do we do? We take the pain for what? Two days, five days, seven days, two weeks. And then what do we do? We drink again anyway. Here's an idea, Slick. Why don't you bypass the pain? Why don't we get by that pain thing? We're going to drink anyway. Why don't we shorten up the process? Why don't we get out of here and get a drink, get a drink, get a drink, get a drink? Why don't we get out of this place and get a drink? Because we're going to do it anyway. Who are you fooling? Let's go get a drink. And I'm leaving Alcoholics Anonymous, not because AA doesn't work, not because you people aren't good, not because there isn't a God, not because the steps don't work. I'm leaving Alcoholics Anonymous because I can't take the pain of sobriety coming up on 48 hours without a drink. And I got nothing in the tank. I got nothing to bring to the game. And it's going to cost me everything. It's going to cost me the place to live. It's going to cost me the last relative on the planet that has anything to do with me. And more than likely, it's going to cost me my life. And you know what? I got to tell you, small price to pay. If it'll make the madness in my head go away for a couple of hours, I'm willing to pay that price. And I caught a break. Because over in the corner were two card-carrying members of Alcoholics Anonymous named Lou and Mark. And Lou and Mark are looking around the room, and Lou and Mark saw me. And the way they tell the story is they saw me, and Lou uh, looked at Mark and went, whoa. (laughs) And Mark looked at Lou and went, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) And Lou said, I bet we can't get him sober. And Mark said, well, we are here anyway. And, uh, (laughs) And they did what I believe is the most important action we take in an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's more important than the format, who's sharing who made the coffee, any of the, any of the minutia, the very important things that go on putting together a good meeting that are all important, but I think the most important action I saw demonstrated to me my second night. Two car carrying members of Alcoholics Anonymous took a 30-foot journey across a clubhouse to cordially welcome a man who was dying from the disease of alcoholism to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Hi, my name is Lou. This is Mark. We don't think we've met you. Why don't you come sit with us? Sounds like such a politeness, such a nicety. Why do I think it's so important? 30 feet for Mark and Lou, for me, it's a million miles. You see, I can't do it. I can't get to you. I can't shake your hand. Don't you understand where I've been, what I've done, who I've hurt? Don't you understand I can't get my eyes off of my shoes? No, no. If Mark and Lou understood the terms of engagement for recovery from the disease of alcoholism, that they would have to carry the message to the alcoholic that still suffers. They sat me down on a table with a half a cup of coffee, and Mark sat with me, and Lou continued to stand, and Lou clapped me in the middle of my back. He said, Don, this is Mark. He'll be your sponsor. And he walked away. (laughs) And they assigned me my first sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I know that's not done everywhere, but in my case, really good idea, because we say things in Alcoholics Anonymous to our new friends. I mean, every meeting I go to, in the format somewhere, we talk about sponsorship. We stress the importance of sponsorship. Get a sponsor, get a sponsor, get a sponsor. And my favorite thing that we say to new people is, find somebody that has what you want. Huh. I wonder what I want my second night in Alcoholics Anonymous. (laughs) Oh, I don't know, maybe a pharmaceutical rep with a spare Cadillac, you know. It's a beginning. Because I'd have never picked the weenie boy they assigned to me, you know what I mean? Because he's everything I'm not. He's soft-spoken, he's bald of head, wire-rimmed glasses, and ooh, he loves God, boy. Ooh. And he's not afraid to tell you about it. He's telling me about God did for them, what God did for her, what God did for him, what God did for him, what God did for her, what God did for them, what God was going to do for me. He's expecting a miracle. And he was on fire with Alcoholics Anonymous. And i got to tell you, it's not what he said. It's how he said it. He was a man with a real answer, and he was giving it away that night. And you know what he had? He had spiritual enthusiasm, and you can't defeat spiritual enthusiasm. I'm at the low point of my existence, and this guy is delighted to see me, and I knew that he was delighted to see me. And he's calling me one of the lucky ones. Isn't that crazy? Low point of my existence, and I'm one of the lucky ones. Don, you're in here with us, man. You made it to Alcoholics Anonymous. They're out there in the streets tonight. We're the lucky ones, Don. We got a chance. We got each other, and we got God. Isn't that great? I guess. You know, just... (laughs) 
And without my permission, I might add, he started to tell me the meetings I'd go to in Alcoholics Anonymous. How do I know that? Because he said, uh, these are the meetings you'll be going to in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he, <laughs> he got a meeting directory, and he started circling meetings, you know. And I'm watching this, and I'm thinking to myself, that's a lot of circling, you know. And, and while he's doing that, he's talking about AA, he's talking about God, he's talking about his sponsor, he's talking about when the meetings start. And at one point, he stopped, and he goes, oh, are, are you working? No, I'm currently unemployed. More circling, more circling, more circling. <laughs> Here's another thing about AA that's really weird. <sighs> go anywhere in the world if you don't have a job, and when they ask you what you do for a living, if you're not working, you say, well, I'm currently unemployed, they'll go, oh, oh I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm sure you'll get a job soon. In AA, when you're new and we go, I'm unemployed, people go, good, that's great. That's wonderful. Thank God you don't have a job. Nothing between you and sobriety. It's a blessing. <laughs> we need, meet new people around here and they go, well, I got a manager, I got a lot of people counting me, I got a lot of stress. We go, uh, bye bye. Uh. She got me a big book, a 12 and 12, that meeting directory. I got in my sister's car that night, and she saw this literature, and she went, oh, my goodness. I go, I know. I think I got homework, and it began. And this man who became my first sponsor taught me everything about Alcoholics Anonymous, all three sides of the triangle. He got me involved in unity, service, and recovery, and he did it from the beginning. And he didn't do it by instruction. He did it by example. He got me involved in service not by telling me what I should do or explaining to me what he used to do in AA. You see, he wasn't a used to. He wasn't a guy with a resume that said, yeah, I've been sober a long time. I used to do committee work. I used to sponsor people. I used to chair meetings. I used to do setup. I used to do cleanup. He wasn't a used to. He was a guy currently involved in the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous. So what he did is he used the spiritual principle of invitation and got me into Alcoholics Anonymous. And he left me a little bit of dignity, and he left me a little bit of respect for myself, and he started to build me up by the actions we take in Alcoholics Anonymous. And he'd say, hey, Don, tomorrow night I've got to set up this meeting. I could sure use your help. You think you can be here early? And I think to myself, my sponsor needs my help. Well, sure, sponsor, anything for you. And a month later, he rolls up on me, and he'd tell me about some committee they were starting. He'd go, listen, we're starting this committee, and I've really noticed you're a pretty bright guy. We could really use your input. And I think to myself, wow, I got the AA just in the nick of time. And <laughs> but he invited me into his service life that he had. And he invited me into his home life that he had. He invited me into the front seat of his car and the front seat of his house. He invited me into his friendships and he introduced me around. And suddenly I found myself 30 days sober in meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm getting sober in a house that was devastated by the disease of alcoholism. And my, you know, it's, it's so funny. I'm so self-obsessed. My sister, my older sister, Pat, she's a psychologist, you know, and she's got a big job and a lot of responsibility. And, you know, I'm so self-obsessed when I knew that I don't really think about it. She has to get up early in the morning. I don't. I'm new in AA. You know what I mean? I just go to AA all day, right? Drink coffee all night. Remember that when you're new? Just sitting there doing it. By the time you've been to three meetings, four meetings that day, and now it's 10 o'clock at night, you just want to go home and go to bed. And somebody goes, hey, you want to go to coffee? And you go, yeah, coffee sounds good. Let's have some more coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Double espresso to really hit the spot, hit the spot, hit the spot right now. You get home around midnight, man. I'm so self-obsessed. There's my sister, man. She's got to get up at five, right? She's up. And I didn't realize it until years later, man, she's up waiting for me, waiting for her brother to come home, the newcomer from Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah, I hate speaking in the morning. Because she wants to hear about AA. And I tell her about AA, you know, and uh, I told her in Southern California, if you're lucky enough to get 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, six months, nine months, man, they'll give you a little token they call it a chip, and they'll present it to you at the meeting, and if you're lucky enough to get a year of continuous sobriety, they'll bake you a cake, put a candle in it, and sing happy birthday. It's absolutely disgusting, and until it happens to you, it's pretty cool, and uh, 
And so I'm telling my sister this stuff, and I'm going to AA every night, man, and I make it to 30 days sobriety, man, and I walk into the room, man, with 30 days, and all the members of AA are looking at me, they're all grinning, they're all grinning like Cheshire cats at me, and I realize, oh my God, they've been counting days with me, and all of you were counting days with me. And I sat down, and they said, anybody for 30 days, and I raised my hand, and everybody applauded and went nuts, like I'd won the Nobel Peace Prize. It's crazy. And I went up and I got this coin, you know, and I don't want you to know how much it means to me. Because I'm so afraid to hope that I found something. So I've been trying to get sober on my own for years, man, and I'm getting slaughtered out there. And now I'm with you and I feel hopeful, but I'm scared. I'm scared it's not real. I keep waiting for the other shoe to drop. I keep waiting to get drunk because that's what I always do. I didn't realize when I was new in Alcoholics Anonymous that God had me in the palm of his hands, that I had a sponsor, I had a home group, I had meetings I was going to, and I had all of you. And that, yeah, I'd taken a long, long, dangerous walk into some dark, dark, dangerous woods, but here is the difference. I walked in alone. I was walking out with Alcoholics Anonymous. CAA didn't stand on the edge of the woods and yell deep into the woods, we're over here, there's salvation over here. You guys walked into the woods and you got me. CAA met me where I was and took me by the hand and walked me to a new life. They met me where I was. 30 days sober, man, I got that colored hunk of aluminum between my thumb and forefinger and it's in my front pocket and I can't let go of it. And I couldn't understand why this stupid little hunk of colored aluminum meant more to me than anything I'd ever accomplished in my life. And I had been some places and done some things. I came home that night and I walked into a home that had been devastated by the disease of alcoholism. I closed that door and I turned around and my sister came around the corner and she had a cupcake with a candle in it and the candle was lit. And my sister started singing happy birthday to me. And she finished the song and I blew out the candle and she said, look, my brother, I know you don't get a cake till you're a year sober, but for you, 30 days is like a year. (laughs) And I didn't understand for many years what really happened that night. You know, my sister had never been to Al-Anon. She had never been to Alcoholics Anonymous. She never read any Al-Anon literature or any AA literature. You know, I really believe it says that a more important demonstration of our principles awaits us in our respective homes, occupations, and and, uh, and affairs. I also absolutely believe that God runs AA. If you don't believe that, look who's sitting next to you. We couldn't pull this off. And I believe that when we come to Alcoholics Anonymous, without our permission, when we get sponsors and we say those prayers and we say, God, help me, God hears that prayer. And the God that runs AA, he attached himself to me. And I believe that God followed me outside the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous into my various homes, occupations, and affairs. And when I came home from AA at night, I brought God with me. And I think the God that runs AA came into that home. And I think the God that gave me hope in Alcoholics Anonymous when I was new started giving my family back the thing that my disease had taken from them for so long. It gave them a little bit of hope. In a spiritual experience at the back of the book, it says, Friends of the newcomer are aware of the change long before he is himself. He suddenly realizes he undergone a profound alteration in his reaction to life, that such a change could hardly have been brought about by himself alone. What often occurs in months could seldom be accomplished by years of self-discipline. And what started to happen in months in that family couldn't be explained because there was so much hurt and there was so much damage. But sponsorship played a big role in that, man. I had a sponsor. He was great. He was kind of like kind of a Yoda ninja hybrid, you know what I mean? Because he was like really wise and soft-spoken, but at the same time, every now and then, he'd just slide the blade in, you know what I mean? And uh, I remember one time, God, I wasn't even sober that long. I was probably sober three months. And uh, he pulls me aside. He goes, so how's things at home? I go, good. He goes, what are you doing to say thank you to your family for letting you get sober in their house? And I said, well, I'm not drinking. (laughs) He goes, yeah, it's mighty big of you. Do me a favor. (laughs) Go home tonight and ask your sister if there's anything you can do for her. It sounded pretty innocuous. I said, okay. And I went home that night and I said, so, uh, Pat, my my sponsor wants to know... um, If there's anything I can do to uh, say thank you for you letting me get sober here. She didn't miss a beat. She goes, well, you can paint my house. And I said, your whole house? And and she said, yeah. I go, "Uh, I got to talk to my sponsor. So I 
I find my sponsor the next night at the meeting. I go, man, this crazy woman wants me to paint her whole house. And he goes, is she buying the paint? I go, I assume. And he goes, ah, you got off easy, paint her house. And he walked away real dismissively, you know what I mean? <laughs> Which he did when he wanted to end the conversation. he just walk away, and I, it always pissed me off. And so I yelled at the back of his bald head. I said, hey, I thought this program was suggested. Uh, that was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know he could move like that, you know what I mean? Uh, he's like back in my personal space, he's looking up at me, I'm looking down on him, and he's wagging that bony finger at me, and he's like, Don, you're so sick that anything that comes out of my mouth, I want you to assume it's a direction. And I'll let you know when you've passed into the suggestion phase of the program. <laughs> So I'm painting her house, and I'm bitter, bitter about it, you know. I'm thinking, this is what happens. You get, you're a drunk, you get sober in AA, and then it's slave labor the rest of your life, you know. And, <laughs> you see, my sponsor, man, was a guy, he was a student of the book, right? So he understood the amends process. He understood that part where it says our man will be more interested in a demonstration of goodwill than our talk of spiritual discoveries. You see, I want to steal your dough, break your heart, steal your car, and say, I'm sorry, I'm an AA, and I found God. We're all good, right? My sponsor was big on the physical demonstration of goodwill. Talk is cheap. People would rather see a sunset than listen to a sermon. Show them you changed. Don't tell them you changed. And I was telling him how I couldn't sleep at night. I was telling him how my sister, how much I loved her and how much she loved me, but because of what I did with my drinking, there was a wall between us. And even in sobriety, we just couldn't seem to break through the wall. We could only be in the same room at the same time for so long without getting uncomfortable. I had my eyes on my shoes a lot because of the guilt, shame, and remorse. My sponsor knew the only way through that was action. And I'll never know for sure what it did for my sister, but I'll know this, the longer I was into that project painting her house, the better I felt. The longer I could be in the same room with her, the longer I could breathe the same air, look her in the eye for a little bit longer. And we got done, we weren't even Stephen, not by a long shot. But I could be in the same room at the same time and feel comfortable with my sister. And Alcoholics Anonymous, in the process of the amends, that physical demonstration of goodwill, don't tell me you're better, show me you're better gave me back one of the most important people I've ever had in my life, my older sister Patricia, and that was through action and sponsorship. Because I'd have never come up with that on my own. And why do I think sponsorship is so important, man? Do you have to be bigger, faster, stronger, and smarter than me to sponsor me? No, absolutely not. There's only a couple of requirements to sponsor a guy like me. One, you got to be grounded in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you got to believe in this with everything you got. That, and you can't have my emotions about my life. And I've always had sponsors that just don't have my emotions about my life. God, I remember my first sponsor, I told him I owed the IRS 80 grand, and I felt terrible about that. Like, I whispered it to him, like, dude, I owe the IRS, like, 80 grand. He goes, 80 grand? I'm like, keep it down, you know. And, <laughs> and you know, he was, like, so nonchalant about it because it was not his 80 grand. You know, I had to go clean up warrants and maybe go to jail. He's like, eh, we'll go to court. It'll be fine. You'll go to jail. You won't go to jail. It's no big deal because he's not going to jail, you know. <laughs> but they won't let you feel bad for yourself in AA. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, and self-pity, any one of those things can kill you. In AA, we won't tolerate self-pity. It's not that we're heartless. We just understand that it's a propulsion system for active alcoholism. That when I'm in self-pity, bet your bottom dollar I'm in untreated alcoholism. So in Alcoholics Anonymous, the other members, man, we pick you up. We, learn, we teach you to laugh at your own misfortune. How do we do that? We laugh at you first <laughs> until you get the joke. The minute my sponsor found out I owed 80 grand, he put it into service in Alcoholics Anonymous. For the next five years, any newcomer that had the audacity of complaining about his little $1,200 IRS debt, my sponsor would be listening to this guy whine. He'd go, hold that thought, Jimmy. Hey, Don, you got a minute? <laughs> I'd walk over. He'd go, Don, tell Jimmy how much you owe the IRS. And I'd look at Jimmy. I'd go, I owe the IRS $80,000. And Jimmy would go, Jesus. And I'd go, just want to be a service. And I'd go, oh. And what sponsorship has taught me more than anything is about being wrong. That being wrong is a necessary ingredient. It's the number one ingredient in change. 
You know, to date, to this moment, standing, standing at this podium in front of you, do you know that I've never worked on a problem I don't have? <laughs> do you know I've never brought anything to God that I would label as a problem that I don't have? You know, and everything that I have brought to God in Alcoholics Anonymous and brought to the sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous is a problem that at one time I didn't think I had. Something that it turned out that I was wrong about that at one point I thought I was right about. I mean, I remember I started dating Eileen. We're married 22 years now, right? I start dating Eileen. I go out with her for three months. I make an appointment with my sponsor to talk about my relationship, and they love that, by the way. Uh, you know, I make your sponsor's day, call him up and say, hey, I want to come over and talk about my relationship. He'll say, good, come on over. I'll load my pistol. <laughs> okay, start talking. <laughs> and then what did she say? And, uh, And so I go over to my sponsor, and I, he goes, what's going on? I go, I'm going to break up with Eileen. He goes, really? What's wrong? I go, nothing. She's perfect. He goes, well, if she's perfect, why are you breaking up with her? I go, I can't take it. I can't take it. It's the pressure. You know, she's wonderful. I mean, I'm madly in love with her. I just can't take it. I mean, I like it when they're into me, not when I'm into them. This is, I, I didn't sign up for this. And he called me a bad name, and he said, he said I couldn't break up with her. And I said, you can't tell me I can't break up with my girlfriend. He goes, well, I just did break up with her, get another sponsor, and then he walked away dismissively, you know what I mean? And here we are, you know, married 22 years, wrong again, and that's me, I'm Don, I'm wrong again, and you know why I have a really good life today? You know, if I had to tell you the two reasons I have a really good life today, one, I was willing to do 10,000 things I didn't think I wanted to do, and two, I've been willing to be wrong. I mean, I'll tell you, like, what I do for a living, God, I was Working construction, I'm working with my hands, and I'd never done that until I got sober. And I'd love to tell you I found out it was my true calling. It is not. I suck working with my hands. My first job, I had a nickname on the job site, The Bleeder. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. So now I'm like three years sober, right? I'm three years sober, and I don't know what to do, man. I'm three years sober. I'm super active in AA. I'm sponsoring guys. I'm sponsored. I'm in the middle of an active home group. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, man. Am I supposed to go back to school? Am I supposed to change careers? And I'm full of fear, man. I'm just locked down with fear. I'm talking my sponsor's ear off about it. And he won't give me any real direction. He goes, Don, calm down. You're in AA. God's got you. He's got you in the palm of his hands. Quit wiggling. God sees you. He'll get you. He's running the universe. He's got a lot on his plate. Trust me. I'm sure you're coming right up. Your big questions about unemployment are right up there with keeping the tides flowing properly. But he's going to get to you, Don. He's going to get to you. Right? And what God's going to do, Don, is he's going to put something right in front of you, and your job is going to be to say yes. He used to talk about this all the time, about God putting things in front of you. You know, I remember going to him, and he's telling me how essential it was that I work with others, right? And I'd say something like, well, I don't mind helping, but who will I help? How will I know who I'm supposed to help? And he said, oh, Don, God made you. And he knows everything about you. So he knows you're not very bright. <laughs> so the people you're supposed to help, he's going to put them right in front of you. So you can't miss them. I've never forgotten that, man. 27 years. And every now and then you get a guy in front of you and you go, this one too, God? Really, this one? You know. <laughs> so he tells me that God's going to put something in my path. And sure enough, a week later, I get this goofy opportunity to go interview for this job. And I don't want to go. I don't want to go. It's in an industry I know nothing about. It's straight commission sales. That's a loser's game. So I'm not going to go. I'm not even going to go interview. But I got training in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I call my sponsor to tell him about the job I'm not going to go interview for. And he goes, well, I want you to go interview. I go, yeah, okay, but I'm not going to do it. He goes, I don't want to. He goes, that's the strangest thing, Don. I don't remember asking you what you wanted to do. <laughs> and I know where that goes, right? So now I go to just get them off my back and I interview you for the job and they hire me on the spot. And usually that's a good thing. I'm pissed off. I call my sponsor up. I go, well, they hired me. Now what do I do, fun guy? And he goes, go to work for him, man. So I go to work for this company who's sliding me 500 bucks a week against commissions I don't have. After three months of working at the company, I owe them $5,000. I'm in full-blown panic mode. I call my sponsor up. I go, dude, the IRS is anxious. We're going in the wrong direction. I owe them five grand. We need to, like, cut and run, like, now. And, he, and my sponsor goes, what does your boss say? 
Ah, he says he's happy with my effort. This is completely normal. Because, yeah, you don't get to quit till they stop inviting you back. Ugh. And I hate my sponsor, and I suck at this job, man. It's sales, and I'm just nervous. And I don't know how to do sales, so what am I doing, right? Am I praying? Am I surrendering? Am I doing what? Treat them the way. No, I'm not doing any of that. I'm reading sales books every night, right? Different techniques, different things. So I'm psychotic. I'm a different salesman every day <laughs> using a different technique. <laughs> and it's getting worse, man. I can't, I can't give something away, let alone sell it, man. And I'm in people's home. I can't look them in the eye. I'm sweating profusely. Oh, oh my God. And it, it just, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And the worst day, the worst day. Oh my God. I'd read this book about instant identification. It said you, this one technique, you got 30 seconds to identify with your potential client. 30 seconds, man. You better figure it out. If you're at their home, man, look, look at the walls, look for clues. They got kids. You love kids. There's a fish mounted. What a coincidence. I'm a fisherman. You know what I mean? You got a dog. I love dogs. What's Rover's name? You know what I mean? You better identify, man. So I, I'm in instant identification mode, man. I'm in the roofing industry. So I introduce myself to this woman, man. I go up. I measure a roof. I come down. We're talking in the front yard. It's going great. It's going great. Big smile on her face. You know, I'm like, hey, this is going pretty good, you know. And I'm looking, instant identification. I'm like, I can't find anything. And I look at her, and it's very obvious to me. So I say this to her. I go, how far along are you? And everything was going great till that moment. And her whole face changed. And she had that look like she'd just eaten a lemon, you know what I mean? And she, she goes, what do you mean? And I'm an alcoholic, man, I should know, like, put down the shovel, quit digging, quit digging, drop the shovel, abort, abort, but I don't, I don't, you know what I say? Well, you're pregnant, aren't you? Oh, just keep digging, just keep digging. And she says, no, and, I'm, and in my brain, the smart part of my brain, the part where my sponsor lives, it's like, drop the shovel, quit digging, but I can't, I'm alcoholic, I can't, I've engaged, you know what I mean, I can't stop. I say, well, did you have a kid recently? <laughs> She says, two years ago. <laughs> I said, thank you for the opportunity to earn your business. And uh, I get in my vehicle, I'm banging my head against the steering wheel. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I call my sponsor up and, I, and I'm not I am literally crying. I'm so crushed. I'm so depressed. I'm literally crying. I tell my sponsor what happened. And now he's crying because he can't stop laughing. <laughs> he's begging me. He says, please, please tell no one this story until I'm there tonight. <laughs> I don't want to miss the look on their faces. My sponsor won't let me quit the job, and what do you know? By the end of the first year, the ship righted itself. I've been in that industry now for over 20 years. It enabled me to make a good living, pay back those amends, do all the things AA suggested I do, get married, make enough money. You know, we live a comfortable life. But I'd have missed it all, and I'd have missed that industry, an industry that I work at a job that lets me take off 25 Fridays a year so I can go do things like this. You know, and I would have missed it all if I had listened to myself because all the information I saw said, we need to get out of here, we need to cut and run. And by being wrong about that, I got to have a different experience of life. But that comes out of sponsored direction. And that's a hard thing to do to get the ego out of the way. And it doesn't get easier, I think it gets harder. Because I'm 27 years sober now, I know some stuff. I've been around AA, thank you very much. I know what the book says, thank you very much. But am I willing to have that same transparency with a sponsor? Am I willing to realize I'll never be able to see myself clearly? That's the things I'm wrong about, the incomplete picture, my perception, that's going to be the problem. And i got to tell you, if the steps don't work and a loving God isn't just that and our thinking doesn't straighten out, what's the point? And i got to tell you, my thinking has changed. About 90% of the time, I'm right on the money. It's that 10% I don't know about. 
Because I don't know which 10% it is. Because I don't know if you're like me, but all of my thinking feels magnificent. <laughs> I mean, I wish I thought in like, sort of my normal consciousness, every now and then the big ding went off, ding, and I went, that's crazy. That doesn't happen to me. It all seems really logical. It all seems really balanced until I'm talking to my sponsor. And there's something about the air being added to my words and audio as it floats over to your... You ever explain something to your sponsor that made a lot of sense to you until you were saying it to them? And then when you heard it in your own voice, you wanted to grab the words out of the air like, oh no, that's insane. <laughs> but I just do what I was taught in my first 30 days in AA. I don't make major decisions without talking to my sponsor. And 90% of the time, he goes, well, you prayed about it, you thought about it, I think you're right on the money, go do it. About 10% of the time, he says, huh, did you come up with that on your own or did you have help? Uh, just, and it's just I have those blank spots, and that's just part of my alcoholism. And it's not a big deal. I don't fight it, I accept it. But I try to live in a transparent method with my sponsor, with my wife, with the guys I sponsor. i got to tell you, the guys I sponsor, trust me, they're aware that I'm imperfect. I do not sponsor from a, from a hilltop. And I'll tell you what, if I've sponsored you for over six months, I've probably made amends to you. And if you sponsor people and you've sponsored them for a long term and you've never had to make amends to them, I don't know, you're a better person than me or you're not in the amends process because I don't get to not make amends because I sponsor you. And sometimes I'm inconsiderate. And sometimes I'm rude. And sometimes I don't call you back when I should call you back. And sometimes I don't do the things that I should do as a sponsor. Not all, very often. But I, that 10th step doesn't allow us to take people aside. I don't get to do a daily 10th step or a spot check inventory and go, yeah, but I don't have to worry about them. I sponsor them. You see, here we're shoulder to shoulder. We're not above and we're not below. We're shoulder to shoulder. We're eye to eye. You know, I want to tell you a story, and I'm going to sit down. I'm running out of time. So I've had this really good life in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have stayed active. I have an active home group. I actively sponsor. I have service commitments. I'm in the district level, always doing something. And I'm overpaid. Uh, you know, 2004, I told you we moved to the Pacific Northwest. And one of the real blessings about living in the woods and where we're at is there's a lot of wildlife. You know what I mean? And when we moved there, we got very excited because there was everything. There's raccoon, and there's skunk, and there's cougar, and there's bear, and there's deer. Beautiful, beautiful deer, and tons of them. And we were so excited when we moved there, man, we're calling all our friends in L.A., we got deer in our backyard. It was unreal. And the first summer, man, the mama deer started showing up with their spotted fawns. And all I can say is if you need 20,000 digital photographs of a baby deer, I got them. You know what I mean? <laughs> we are freaking out. We got baby deer. And, oh. And this one, this one family, this one mama and baby, we just fell in love with them, right? Because the baby boy deer, man, he was real inquisitive and real brave, and he'd run right up to you and then run away. And, like, and we're city kids, so we're naming the deer. And the baby deer had this big scar across his face, so, you know, ran into a fence. Or I made up a story about him defending his mom's honor and getting beat up by a buck or whatever. And the, but we named them, and that was Mama Deer and Scratch. Mama Deer and Scratch, right? And they showed up every day in our yard and just would, you know, eat plants and just we just just we just hang out, look at the deer. And then fall came in rutting season, and the deer start losing their summer coats and putting on their winter coats, and they actually change color from like they're like a really blonde and they start getting this dark coat on for winter, and uh, but not scratch. And this baby deer, you know, his coat started looking really, I don't know, scruffy. And he started getting really patchy. And I mentioned it to Eileen. I go, is it me or does Scratch look rough? She goes, no, there's something wrong with him. And, and Eileen is like that girl, man, right? So she got on the Internet and she researched it. And she reported back to me it's actually an affliction they get in their first year called deer hair loss syndrome. And if they lose enough hair, winter will come and they'll get hypothermic because they won't be able to eat enough to keep their furnace going and they'll die. And I said, Scratch is going to die? She goes, yeah. And I go, oh. Not on our watch. And, uh, and we lost our minds, man. And we started doing, we started breaking every Washington state wildlife law on the books, right? <laughs> I'm going to the feed store and ordering 50 pound sacks of cob and molasses. The guy's going, How many heads you got? I don't know. How many head would this feed? He goes, I don't know, two. I go, I got two. So now I'm lying. Oh. And Eileen is setting up, fun, you know, supplemental feeding stations in the backyard. And the problem with that is if you've got one sick deer you're trying to feed, you can't feed the one sick deer. So we got deer coming from everywhere. We got 15, 20 deer in our backyard. There's my wife, five foot three. She got 150 pound bucks in the backyard. She's chasing 155 
pound bucks out of our backyard going, you're selfish, you're self-centered, let the sick one eat, get out of here. <laughs> Where am I? I'm on the deck going, be careful, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I thought I was going to have to mount a buck's head with my wife stuck to the antlers, you know what I mean? It was like, Jesus. Fearless, fearless. <laughs> and it's not helping, man. It's not helping. You know, he's losing more and more fur. And I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with this baby deer, man. I go to work in the day. I call Eileen from work. I go, you see Scratch today? She go, yeah. I go, how's he look? She go, not good. And I get mad at God. Not this one, God. You don't get this one. And just obsessed with this baby deer. This goes on for the whole winter. Now it's snowing in the winter. My wife's building lean-tos in the backyard so they have shelter from stupid baby deer two feet from the lean-to in the snow getting covered shaking she's like idiot the lean-to newcomer over there you know just uh. <laughs> this goes on for all the winter and we make it to spring and scratch doesn't die and uh ah, for the next three or four years every fall in the running season he'd show up in our backyard with all the boys come down from the high country magnificent buck and we knew it was him because of the scar and beautiful rack and he'd walk slowly right up to Eileen in the backyard and Eileen would feed him apples by hand and I'd look at that and I think to myself what was it about that damn deer that made me lose my mind and then one day it hit me I'm that baby deer you know I'm that guy at the Simi Valley Alano Club with my back against the wall thinking I gotta leave and go get a drink and anybody that saw me that night, anybody with a glancing familiarity with alcoholism, would have taken one look at me and said, that guy, that guy over there, he's going to die. And two car carry members of Alcoholics Anonymous saw the exact same thing, and they said, not on our watch. And they did what they had been taught to do in AA. And they cordially welcomed me, and they gave me that spiritual first aid. And they brought me into the rooms, and they brought me into the heart of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they saved my life. And I know this as much as I know I'm standing here right now. Bill and Bob are gone. They've left us a beautiful legacy. But it's our watch now. And this weekend while we're in here, you know, safe, sane, and sober, having a wonderful time, I know this, they're out there in the streets and they are dying. And more interestingly than that, they are coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. They don't even know it yet. They're finishing up their stories, you know, adding those last few lines on that essay of destruction. But bet your bottom dollar they're coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, and they're coming just the way that we came. Hopeless, helpless, and hapless, not knowing why they're here, not knowing what they're looking for. But please, maybe there's an answer here. I just can't take it anymore. They're going to come with that same lost perspective. And when the question we have to ask ourselves when they arrive in Alcoholics Anonymous is, where will we be? And more importantly, how will we be? Will I be at my home group with my buddies in the back cutting up, talking about the fishing trip, the football, and this and that, and what's going on, and the big deal I made, and hey, I like your new truck? Or am I going to leave all that crap in the parking lot where it belongs, where it has no business crossing the spiritual threshold of a meeting hall of Alcoholics Anonymous? Am I willing to shut off my vehicle before I get off when I arrive in the parking lot at St. James Church on 14th Street in the Fairhaven District of Bellingham to go to my home group? Am I willing to shut down my rig and take a moment and say a prayer? God, I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and i got the world hanging all over me. It's dripping off of me. I'm thinking about my money. I'm thinking about that project. I'm thinking about what i got to get done tomorrow. I'm thinking about what I'm going to do when I get home, and I'm not ready to go to a meeting. Take away my selfishness. Give me eyes that can see. Give me a heart that can feel. There's men in there. It's just another Monday night for me. It's just another Wednesday night for me. It's just another Thursday night for me. But I don't know. This could be somebody's last night in AA. Let me be there like Mark and Lou. Let me be there and give somebody the attention that I was given. Let me somebody know that maybe they're safe haven at last. And now I'm ready. Now I can get out of the rig. Now I can go into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous because I've left the world outside. Now it's not about getting a cup of coffee and connecting with my buddies. It's about looking at the room like Mark and Lou did. Where are the new people? Make sure I cordially welcome them. I don't think I've met you. My name is Don. I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I know the way out. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.